introduction, if that's okay. Sure. So today we're here to celebrate Dean Viva, kind of, <laughs> so a, a practice Viva talk. We have a special guest, by the way, Simon Hans. Thank you, Simon, for, for coming. So Dean, a little background about Dean's thesis. Dean's thesis is a little bit more complicated than average because for two basic, well, three kind of reasons, but one reason is it's a cross-disciplinary PhD between computer science and physics and Simon's presence. So Simon was, is a co-supervisor from the Department of Physics. His first, first supervisor was Rita Borgo, so Rita Borgo trained universities. And his second, first supervisor is myself. So that also makes things a little bit more complicated, I would say. And why are we having a practice viva? Well, it's, it makes sense because this is for most people that are doing a PhD, the most important presentation and or discussion of their entire lives, right? So you, <laughs> you may as well practice. Maybe Joss can back me up on that. So, you know, you may as well practice for it, right? And most people, I believe, do not practice, which is also part of the fun, the fun things. Now, here's some advice. What most PhD students think about when they think about a viva, especially in computer science, I've only seen computer science vivas, they are obsessed about how things happen. They're worried about the how questions, like, oh, the external examiner is going to ask me how I implemented this part of the algorithm. Oh, I'm sure they're going to ask me about how step four of this part works. That is really not what examiners are going to be asking, actually. That's not generally the direction they're coming from. They're not going to concentrate so much on how. That, that's not going to be the main focus. The main focus of their questions, and this is where PhD candidates often get shocked and surprised and caught off guard, is they're going to asking a bit, be asking about why you did things and, and what you did. The why and the what are going to be the focal points of the questions there will be questions about how, it's not like they're off the, off, the, off the table, but the big questions and the important ones are going to be focused on why and what, you know, especially the why. And uh, we're going to ask Dean those questions too. D Dean at least got a little bit of, of, of a tip, I at least say. I hope not, that's him as well. <laughs> yeah, and... and so I've seen many candidates get totally caught off guard by very basic why and what questions. They just don't see them coming. They've been, they've been deep in the how for three years. They've been concentrating on the how are we going to get this done, how is this going to work, blah, blah, blah. And then the examiners are coming from the outside world and they want to know a lot about the how, the what, and the why. And so we're going to try to prepare Dean with some what and why questions. And the more questions we can ask, the better Dean will be prepared. I don't have that many questions prepared, so everybody here is welcome to ask questions. I'm going to try to ask some fundamental questions. Hopefully Simon is too, and then don't be afraid to ask any questions. I'm a little bit like an external examiner because I haven't been with Dean his whole time. I don't know all the details about his, his, his work, right? so I'm a little bit on the outside. Sound like fun? Yeah. You ready, Dean? Good for it. <laughs> good, good. Okay. So um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview because I was asked to do a sort of 10 minute presentation for my viber. Uh, so I'm going to begin by giving a bit of a background to the problem. Um, so I'm going to introduce what Lattice QCD is. Uh, I'm going to outline the sort of objectives we came up with and quickly run over the techniques that we use for the thesis. 
uh, and then I'm going to spend a bit of time going over the actual results, so um, how we initially used it to sort of validate our data. Uh, we then progressed on to using topology to uh, start to look at the data at a connectivity level, uh, and then we moved on to a, a comparing the variables on the same lattice. Uh, and finally, I created an ensemble study which would fit in a bit more towards the uh, physicist workflow, so uh, much more analytical. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, the application tool that uh, was created alongside the PhD. So, uh, Lattice QCD. Uh, so, it comes from quantum chromodynamics, which is uh, a physical theory for uh, describing a strong nuclear force. So this works at the subatomic level uh, to describe the um, way that particles such as protons and neutrons are bound together. So protons and neutrons are made up of quarks and they're held together using gluons. Uh, these systems work in colour neutral states, so uh, they use colour to sort of represent charge, so we have uh, red, green, blue would be a neutral system, uh, red, anti-red would be a neutral, uh, neutral system. Um, in order to actually look at the quarks on their own, uh, you need a sort of um, amount of energy to separate these systems, which approach infinite amounts. Uh, so for this reason, we, uh, well, physicists uh, model the theory on a four-dimensional lattice in space-time. So the actual field variables don't exist on the uh, vertices of the lattice. Instead, you use closed loops on the lattice to um, compute multiple fields. Am I allowed am I, am I to ask questions while, during the presentation, or do we wait to the end? The ground rules. I would I would suggest we let Dean do the the uh, the presentation because I think that if we start asking questions now, the presentation will never finish. So you'll get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had psychic waves from you, and I picked up vibes that that you had questions. <laughs> um, so one of the Fundamental parts of lattice QCD is the idea of the Wilson loop. Uh, this is a, a closed loop on the lattice, which is a path order modification of um, SU2 matrices. Um, a unit loop is known as a plaquette, um, so we have like space like and time like plaquettes which uh, determine whether uh, the plaquettes exist in a temporal plane. Um, and one of the major fields we look at in our particular work is topological charge density, and this is a combination of a space-like and a time-like plaquette from the same um, site. And this uh, gives rise to a four-dimensional pseudo-particle known as the instanton, which is one of the major particles that, or one of the major observables we need to examine. Um, so, given these objectives, um, we start out by looking at the existing literature in lattice QCD, uh, which is quite limited. Uh, we have plots and surface plots uh, in two dimensions. Uh, we also have like some uh, previous work with ISO surfaces and direct volume renders, but it's all very static. It's not uh, exploratory, uh, so you can't really interact with the data. Um, from the set of tools we come up with, then we want to try and come up with some new ways of measuring lattice QCD observables, and if possible, generalise these so they can fit into existing workflows. So the key techniques we used, uh, we start out with ISO surfaces, which uh, creates a, a model, a mathematical model, uh, at a specific ISO value or function height. So in this case, generally, it relates to the energy. Uh, we also use the contour tree, which then works out connectivity between uh, individual uh, surfaces in the isosurface. Um, from that, we can seed contours using the flexible isosurface algorithm. 
Uh, limitation of contour tree is it doesn't work on the periodic boundaries of lattice QCD. So we then use the read graph to actually compute the true topology of the data set. Uh, and then when we move on to multivariate data, we use the joint contour net. And this allows us to compare multiple variables on the same lattice. And um, throughout the uh, case studies, we used the idea of topological persistence to assign quantities to uh, the observables. So um, you can work out the range on the ISO value, so where it appears and where it disappears as the ISO values change. Uh, and also um, compute rough um, ideas of volume and surface area using these approaches. So we began by um, using visualization as a way of actually validating the data. Uh, the data we had was uh, come in as binary files, so one of the first tasks was to actually model the lattice and reconstruct the data from the uh, lists of numbers from the Fortran code. Um, from this, we used an existing technique of um, direct volume renders, uh, which was uh, come up with at Swansea physics department to initially model the data and examine it. Uh, we then used a, a, a transparency to sort of um, thin out the data to the observables we want. So in the top right corner we can see a direct volume render with the transparency set to avoid the, the central region. Uh, from that we then started to play around with ISO surfaces. So in the bottom left corner we have a set of ISO surfaces across the range. Um, we have uh, orange um, transfer function to mark the maxima, which uh, correspond to a, a positive instanton, and the blue region, which corresponds to an anti instanton. Uh, we uh, played around with that a bit more and found that we could filter out the data based upon the domain knowledge. So in the bottom right corner, we filter out the region of population in the centre, which uh, is largely noise, and uh, we focus on the actual core observables. Uh, we did this in um, collaboration with the physicists who actually found the isosurface to be very interesting and started to ask questions about what the actual, what we could actually find out about the objects. So from this, we looked into the idea of topology. So this computes the actual connectivity within the data to tell us what individual objects uh, appear in the data. So each arc on the read graph on the right-hand side corresponds to a single object. Um, and as you vary the ISO value, you'll find the, uh, the contour changes shape as it merges with other objects. So the actual merge points and the births and depths of objects are the critical vertices. Uh, so from this we are able to seed individual objects and ask questions of the individual objects. Uh, we're also able to use the topology to sort of create a signature of a single configuration. Uh, from this we are able to uh, compute a, a set of sort of um, quantities for each configuration that we looked at. Uh, we then moved on to the idea of using uh, bivariate topology. So in this case, we're now looking at two fields defined on the same lattice. Uh, we use this in two ways. We first looked at it as a way of examining the effect of the temporal lattice uh, as the time was increased in our 4D data. So uh, we found that actually we could track objects uh, in four dimensions using the joint contour net. Uh, they actually persisted in the data for the majority of the um, time axis, uh, even at a reduced energy level, uh, which, which was kind of we weren't expecting to begin with. Um, we also used the joint contour net to actually compare uh, different fields. So, besides being part of the uh, the topological charge density, at instant time actually appears in the space-like plaquette and the time-like plaquette. So using the joint contour net, we can queue them up on the same lattice and look for um, signatures within the 
bivariate topology. Um, we also tried out several different fields uh, for this technique and we found some were actually more interested than others in terms of the observed tools. Um, an interesting outcome was that in the case study we found that the space light plaquette and the time light plaquette seemed to lack uh, symmetry, which uh, we would sort of expect from a neutral configuration, but that this could be just a, a artifact of the actual configuration. Um, from this, we then computed a, a bunch of um, quantities from the data, so we can actually tell you how many vertices exist in the joint contour net, each of which um, represents a region of the uh, multi field. Um, we can also compute things like the um, alignment of the functions. So we use these ideas to then move on to a more conventional lattice QCD workflow, which is to look at these uh, configurations in huge numbers. So um, for each uh, ensemble, where a set of parameters are used to generate the ensemble, we have up to 50 configurations. Uh, and we'll look at multiple ensembles, so we're looking at several hundred configurations here. So beyond the sort of limits of what can be looked at purely by visual inspection. Um, so what we have here is two um, polyakov loop observables, which is a loop around the time axis in a path order. And we expect a lack of symmetry potentially as new increases which is the chemical potential. And at the top we have a chemical potential of zero, which uh, shows us large red regions which is captured by the joint contour net on the right hand side. Uh, the green region in the middle represents the like, connectivity between the, the slabs. On the bottom we have uh, a um, polyapoth loop at 0 0.9 and we can see the actual structure visibly looks potentially different and we can capture this in the joint contour map. Um, and by looking at multiple um, configurations on mass, we can take um, quantities we can compute from the joint contour net and use it as a way of um, predicting differences between the levels of chemical potential. Um, interestingly, we found some potential um, similarities between physical predictions, although as this is the first time the work's been carried out, we can't use that as a definite that we've proven something. Uh, and finally, um, so QCDVIS was an application we used um, throughout the PhD, it was developed from more or less the start in collaboration with a physicist to provide a way to interact with the data and for the physicist to uh, explore the data in new ways. Um, so from this, we started to get the idea of um, looking at individual objects. Uh, user can um, select and hide particular objects. Uh, we're also able to ask questions about each of the objects, so the levels of consistence, uh, so the volumes, uh, and things like that. So it comes as two parts, there's an ensemble module which allows you to compute multiple fields for different ensembles uh, using statistical physics cues to um, guide the physicist towards the interesting data. And then we have the visualisation module where we can actually view the data using uh, topological visualisation techniques and uh, multivariate techniques. Um, Excellent. Thank you, Dean. So normally what would happen is the examiners have a copy of the thesis in front of them and they flip through it and ask questions. You guys don't have that. I have a, co a digital copy. Simon, if you want to look at a digital, a digital copy, I have it here as well. I'm happy not to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I might do that depending on how the question and answer period goes and how long it lasts and all that stuff.
but I also I have some questions I'd like to ask, and, and I'm sure everybody else in the audience does too. But I think Simon yeah, wants to ask first. Can I get some? <laughs> well, I, I was <laughs> struck by something I think on one of the first transparency you showed. So the, you're looking at a four-dimensional world, mm -hmm. and the obvious question is why? Because we live in three dimensions. Protons and neutrons are little points moving around in three dimensions. Why? What, 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 so what, why, why, why is it necessary to use four dimensions? In the world of lattice QCD, the temporal or the time direction, by varying that, you can actually simulate different temperature lattices. So I must admit, I don't exactly understand how that works. But, <laughs> but well, you, you didn't can... mention temperature earlier. But, uh... No. Uh, but yeah, by uh, so if you have a we have lattices of twelve time slices and the twelve uh, twenty four time slices on the same uh, x y z uh, dimension and by lowering the number of time slices you produce a hotter lattice. Mm. So I think what you've told me is that three of the dimensions correspond to space and one of time, which. Is but what is it? I mean, again, many physical situations are simulated with a three-dimensional lattice and things just, we allow, we allow things to evolve in time. Um, why, why, why do we, in this case, have you kind of built your house in four different directions rather than three? Uh, I'll be honest, I don't actually know. <laughs> never really questioned that. Remember the why, the why questions? Yeah. These are the these are the ones. These are you're going to get a lot of why questions. Yes. Yeah, that's something I've never actually really questioned. Is why exactly? <laughs> <laughs> I know you could use that as a closed system. There is an answer. In the time there is an answer. I never actually questioned why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to discuss that question, or do you want to just we can uh, talk after? It. I'm happy to discuss it now or afterwards, whatever, whatever, whatever suits. Mm. It's lovely. Uh, thank you. Mm. You're going to need to take notes, Steve. Yeah, the planet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, I think it's only, you can't really ask a question and not, 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 not develop it. <laughs> uh, the most Im what, one important fact about QCD, this theory you've introduced, is that it's a relativistic theory. Okay, yeah. So rel relativity is a, is a kind of it's a modern view of, of the world and, and the way that things happen, and it says that space and time are more connected, more alike than you might naively think. Okay. And in some particular, different observers will actually perceive um, space and time to be rotated into each other or transformed into each other in some way. Just so it's, it's a question of what's space and what's time to some extent, depends on your point of view. So if you're trying to understand a relativistic theory, you really have to treat space and time on the same footing. Okay. So it's necessary, if you're, going to, if you're going to discretize the time, the space axes, you should also discretize the time axis, and, and actually then require that your theory more or less looks the same, along with walking along time as it does along space. Okay, so it should look the same. Yeah, and you, yeah, you mentioned the fact that you expect symmetries between space and time. And, uh, How, um, how's the best way to explain the link between temperature and um, You could either completely avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that'd be alright as long as they don't ask that question. <laughs> that's really, it's, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough to explain that in a simple way. <clears throat> okay. This but you didn't mention temperature once in your presentation. No, I did uh, originally when I went through it, I tried to like yeah. mention the phase diagram and I skipped over that. <laughs> so this, this is a very tricky aspect. So Dean has to know something about physics, right, for his <laughs> viva and his thesis. Mm -hmm. And the big question is, how much does Dean have to know about physics? Right, and, and that's a big question. Yeah, I don't. We don't have a black and white answer for that. Actually. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I, I'm. A, they're going to be two computer scientists at the examination table. Yeah, I'm going to give you a question that a computer scientist is going to ask. 
what is chromodynamics? Uh, it's, so it's the theory of um, the strong nuclear force. And I'm guessing the chromodynamics comes from the color confinement principle. <laughs> Would that be correct? <laughs> So I've never actually considered where chromodynamics come from. I always assumed it comes from colour confinement. Okay. Well, you're just colour in Greek, so I'm sure. Yeah. It is, it is, it is colour, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's not a profound answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's an answer. You, you need to have a, an yeah. answer prepared for You that actually question. did, you, you did cover it. So, in, 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 in the theory of the strong attraction, there is the idea of threeness is somehow important. We even call it triality, if we want to impress our friends. Um, so, Dean said that instead of talking about charge, you talk about there are three kind of charges, and he called them red, blue, and green. And that's, that's what it is. It's just that you replace the idea of, of there being charge, which is kind of a one-dimensional concept with, with a three-dimensional concept. And then it's the kind of... It, the, the, the kind of Calling it colour stuck, mm. and one one way of understanding that is that and again this is something you did mention that we, we have this uh, nice kind of um, heuristic that if you take three primary colours and mix them you get something white which is which is quite un, you know, quite unexpected. Yeah. Um, similarly, if you take a colour and it's complementary colour or it's anti colour, you also get white. And those principles are very, very similar to the principles for stable particles in UCD. Yeah. It can either be three quarks, mm -hmm. which make a stable object, or it can be a quark and then an anti-quark. Yeah. And those are the two sort of dominant objects. Which yeah, so I don't think I ever actually asked what it's called. I always just assumed it was due to colour confinement. So. Well, colour is the object, yeah. yeah. So colour confinement is a statement that all the things you see under normal conditions are white. Yeah. So you know, you, you know. It's virtually impossible to not yeah. see. Mm. Hence why it's yeah. Okay, in what is the quantum part then? What is quantum chromodynamics? So each of these uh, paths has an, basically an infinite number of ways of traversing the lattice. Um, part of the idea of quantum mechanics is you can traverse any possible way. Um, so when we do the, config, uh, the ensembles, we try to cover as much of that configuration space as possible. So the reason we do ensemble studies is because we have to take an average of a multiple potential paths through the lattice. Uh, so that's why mm -hmm. like the actual observables for the um, ensemble study will actually be the average of, say, 50 con separate configurations because we're trying to cover as much of the configuration, configuration space as possible. So does the quantum come from the, the, does the quantum come from a lattice, or does it come from nature? Uh, it's, I would say so, it's a natural phenomenon, so... So it comes from, the quantum part comes from nature, or does it come from the, no, the it's, lattice? No, it's, it's, it's in nature. Dean, Dean's okay. answer was perfectly correct. Okay, good. Computationally, good. we deal with the... the well with done. The, <laughs> the, quant the, the, the quantum aspect of the computation is, is, is precisely the requirement to average over an ensemble because you're kind of averaging over all the different possible, poss possible things that could happen or a representative sample of all the different yeah. possibilities. And that's what quantum theory says you have to do. So it's a very like, important part of the actual being able to create mm. um, quantities to average over the because you won't want to look through 20,000 configurations for a, a pattern, so that's why we try to quantify things from the joint contour matter. So in a, in a sense, these first three questions have covered the three essential features of QCD. It's a relativistic theory, it's a quantum theory, and it's a theory which, with, in which threeness is important. And, uh, you know, I could, I could invent some mathematical lingo to make that more solid, but it's... It's, it, it's complicated because of the threeness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, you, you, it would be something to consider to add a, a, a slide that says what quantum, quantum chromodynamics is before jumping into the, okay, so. the 
you know, this more sort of detailed description. Okay, so yeah, that will be fine. I can I can slide just on QCD in general before I go into the, like the actual lattice. Okay, I, I asked, do you want to ask us question, another question, Simon? Can I have I, another question which I'm happy to ask when it's, <laughs> when it's my turn again. <laughs> Who asked the last, was it me? I asked the... <laughs> Who's the good cop? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my question. <laughs> so, Dean, you mentioned that in your, one of the big sort of how problems that you dealt with was mm -hmm. uh, this question of periodic boundary conditions. Could you explain a bit more about what, what, what that means? So, in order to um, simulate a potentially infinite universe, we uh, connect the far extremes of each boundary to uh, well, left and right, effectively. So it becomes a hypertorus. Um, and for this reason, there is no boundary as such for the data, so every point on the lattice is treated as equivalent. So you, if you were to look at a specific site on the lattice, you couldn't tell where it was in relation to the boundary because there is no boundary. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's the major reason. That's, a, that's a perfect why answer for the, for, so I'm, I'm happy because I'm physicist. So, I thought the answer to that was because the simulation is faster and easier if there are no boundaries. It's not. Well, it's not only faster. And that's that is part of the answer. But te technically, it's much easier to to think about a world where every site is equivalent. And the minute you introduce boundaries, uh, then you've got some sites which are close to the boundary and some sites which aren't, yeah. and, they're, and they're not all equivalent. And it's, this it's, is it's, a a great... it's a needless complication. Yeah, this is a great, this is a great cult, this is a classic, I would say, a classic cultural difference. So going from the world of mathematics and physics, mm -hmm. where everything is infinite and there are no boundaries, to the world of computer science, where suddenly yeah. you have to have boundaries. Yeah, and it, there's often lots of discussion a challenge. about that. Com so compl I <laughs> completely agree with that. Yeah, because we find um, a lot of the actual you know, algorithms assume a boundary. But it, 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 was, it was one of the major technical obstacles, yeah. wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Getting around yes. So it, is, is this boundary the, the, the equator of the, the two equations of Taurus? You go off one side of the cube and you appear back on the other yeah, side. No, no, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 But the size of the boundary is the size of the, the equator. You know what I mean? Well, it, it depends on what, the, what you're mapping the domain to. Dean has lots of different domain mappings, like some of them are cubes, some of them are graphs, oh, okay. yeah. some of them are, I don't know, isosurfaces or something. Yeah. If I walk across the room and go out of the window, I'd really make the door. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so the, the, the point about the torus is there's no curvature. Oh, no, no, sure. yeah, it's, it's just a... I guess the strangest thing I found was that the time axis is also periodic, so there is no end of time, it just wraps back around, which is... Where the idea of the temperature. Yeah, that, that is pretty freaky. It's like the only really good news here. So th this is this is going to be interesting because you could end up with a viva that's only questions about physics. <laughs> you know, I'm nothing about interested. this. <laughs> that's part of the, the danger. I, well, I think we have to anticipate some because definitely, the ideas definitely. are just so really wild. Uh, yeah, you know, everyone's going to want to know a little bit. Definitely, yeah, definitely. They're going to be asking you basic questions yeah. like, like the ones we're asking you today. But luckily, I harassed Simon quite a bit during my <laughs> like three or four years. Uh, okay, how about <laughs> I would be prepared to answer this one. What's a lattice? It's a potential. Well, it's basically a grid of um, where each point exists on the integer uh, index. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, each side can be identified by four integers. Um, that's kind of how I would uh, describe it. It's just a write that question down on your notes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> have that. Have an answer ready for that. What are they good for? Is the next question. Uh, providing points to sample from in terms of visualization. <laughs> <laughs> so Simon, maybe you can shed some light on that. 
that why are you using lattices? Why you why you use them at all? That's the sort of awful question. <laughs> I, might, I might consider asking in a physics PhD viber. I mean, it's, it's, that's a really tough question to answer properly. Yeah, we need uh, we need something. We need something. You need a uh, set of discrete points where you can actually sample the function. I guess. Um, okay, let me give the party line is that. If you have a, qu a relativistic quantum theory, then um, <coughs> you actually need to sample the theory. You, you need to specify a shortest distance in some means or other. Um, because otherwise, <coughs> intermediate steps in the calculation are very difficult to, to define. This is not stuff that we've really discussed. Yeah. Um, so the lattice is a, is a very technically very convenient way of doing and you know, visually very appealing way of doing that. We just say there's a shortest distance that, that I'm prepared to, to, to include in my calculation and the best, the best way of doing that is to set up a lattice. And I, I really would leave yeah, it there. Just yeah. basically describes a, yeah. a set of yeah. sampling points. Yeah. Another, another possibility you know, because again, it's going to be from computer scientists. You you want to say so? I I would, I would say something like. Something like. I don't have the full physics background, but from yeah. talking, from working with physicists. Yeah. I and I believe them. They have told me that this is a good approximation of space and time for their theories. Yeah. Actually, I, that, okay. If you if you if for me. First of all, there are other ways of defining a shortest distance, which uh, various various theoretical physicists will, will use different approaches. Uh, the advantage of the lattice is to, I think, is 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 that it. Well, first of all, it, it, it yields a, a version of theory which is very amenable to powerful computation. For all the reasons that you know, you all know about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it's it and it's, and it's visually appealing as well. Uh, it's easy, meaning it's easy to visualize and you can do everything that Dean's done. Um, and actually, it's in a certain kind of way, we, we almost regard it not... And again, this isn't something that you necessarily want to stress, but I want to say it anyway. We don't necessarily regard it as an approximation of theory. We, we, we would more regard it as a definition of the theory, <coughs> where the, we were always thinking in terms of making that spacing to the lattice points very, very small. So that, we call that the continuum limit. You're all visual computer people. You, you know what I'm talking about, I think. As, as you decrease the space in between the pixels or the, the elements of the, of the image, it starts to look like a smooth image. Mm -hmm. But we actually mm -hmm. see that not so much as a way of, of simply approximating the theory, but we actually see it as operationally as a way of defining it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is the quantum part related to the space between the nodes and the lattice? Well, the space in those lattice defines, defines the short distance scale. And in the quantum theory, it turns out that a, sh a, short, a short distance scale is, is, is equivalent to a large energy scale. So energy and energies and time or, moment, and time or distances are, have an inverse relation. And that, that's rooted in something called the uncertainty principle. So the quantum bit is... is the quantum bit is, 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 is kind of saying, um, yeah, so it's, it's already beginning to sound quite okay. mystic, isn't it? Yeah, don't, don't, yeah. don't worry about yeah. that, it's, it's getting away. Yeah. But at, at sometimes, there are some times when, you, when you're going to not know the answer to a physics question. Yeah. But you're going to need an answer anyways. You know, it, it, you need some, you need to, an answer, you know, you need, like, so, like an answer, something like I don't know, I don't have the full physics background, but this is what yeah. I've been told by my yeah. my physics collaborators, and, so, and I I believe them when they told me this. Yeah, you know that sort of thing. Rather my than just is I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I have a question. What is data visualization? <laughs> uh, it's a way of taking. Uh, data and present it in a way that can be uh, interpreted by humans uh, 
it covers a vast way, uh, amount of different approaches. So write that down in your notes. You need to have a, you need to have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you need to make it sound like you know what database <laughs> is. <laughs> That's what your PhD is. That's yeah, and, and this is a typical typical yeah. question. Very typical. Catches everybody off guard. But hey, you're, you're a PhD candidate in data visualization. You can't. You're not like yeah. comfortable telling me what data visualization is. Yeah. Okay, and the next question is, what is data visualization good for? Uh, so it allows you to explore the data set. Um, from from our experience with the physicists, it allows them to create new questions. Uh, it also assigns meaning to the actual data they had. So um, typically, it comes out in this case as a set of. Uh, matrices and that, uh, using visualization we can actually get a sense of what we're actually looking at. Uh, Write that question down in your notes. You need to have a good answer for that too. So what was that again? What is data visualization good for? Like they might ask a, a very likely or some <coughs> variant of this question is why did the physicists want you to use data visualization? Right? Because it was written into my funding. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true answer, but not a correct one. So you, you, you like, did you take, you took the data viz module, yeah. right? Did we, that's a slide in the data viz module. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I need to think of the actual highlight. Well, hang on. I think we're now confusing Dean. You're on the spot. and you, let's, let's wind back. Can you remember the physics problem that we were actually interested in solving when we start set out? Um, so I believe it was in order to help with the phase diagram. So in order to be able to sort of <coughs> compute some sort of physical properties or some sort of properties of the data uh, on the phase diagram as chemical potentials. Okay, so probably, probably you need to help everyone by explaining what a phase diagram is. So the phase diagram is a two-dimensional visualization uh, on the y-axis we have temperature on the x-axis, we have an idea of what chemical potential. Uh, as chemical potential is varied, you get a different phases of uh, matter. Um, so typically, QCD is focused upon a neutral chemical potential, so you look at the temperature of the system. Um, but in our case, we're able to vary the chemical potential so we can simulate different types of environments. So uh, at the far extreme we get uh, things like neutron star cores. Uh, from that we can tend to plot like a, well the phase diagram basically shows the boundaries between different states of matter. Quachionic matter, is that <laughs> uh, yeah, everything everything you said is is correct. Cool. <laughs> Can you help us a bit more with chemical potential? Because not many of us have chemical potentiometers in our, in our kitchen. So, what, what, what's it actually, what, what kind of physical property is it actually related to? Um, I know it has a <laughs> tendency to influence where we get a bias of more positive than negative quarks. Yeah. yeah. Would that be a. <laughs> Valid. That's that's that, again. That's the correct answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're, we're basically the thing which people will actually understand is if you say it's related to the density of quarks in the room. Okay. So yeah, effectively the number of the number. Of yeah. Negative. So again, this is this is this. Normally we, we we kind of think we know what that means. It's just the number of things per unit volume. Yeah. When you're dealing with a the relativistic theory, um, one of the kind of complications is that we have particles and antiparticles, and they, that that's a, that is a consequence of of of, of special relativity. Um, so actually, it turns out that the correct thing to count is the number of particles 
minus the number of antiparticles yeah. in per unit volume. And when you turn the chemical potential dial, uh, that you're, you're changing that quantity. And, and then, as you said, the, correctly said, eventually you'd get to very, very dense environments like the center of a neutron star. But even the center of a, of a nucleus in an atom would be an example of a region with chemical potential. Mm -hmm. well. So that's... <coughs> can you then say what physics problem you, we thought visualization would help to address or solve when we started? Write that question down. <laughs> I have that question on my notepad too. So, okay. so both of us uh, are trying to ask you that question. <clears throat> I asked this question, by the way, when we had a meeting in our office. I don't know if you probably know. It's a long time ago, but that was my first question when I was introduced to you two for the first time on this project. Which one of us curled up the more? <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough question. Uh, the way I understand it was just mainly to look at what chemical potential did to the, to the ensembles as you changed it. Uh, so, like, we were, well, we were interested in, like, the uh, balance of uh, Instantons and anti instantons. Would that be a valid? That's half the answer, yeah. So, my very, very naive thinking was that you have a, you have a system which, in all other senses, is constant, but you're turning one knob mm -hmm. and just seeing if, it, if, if things look different as you turn that knob. That, that, that was. So, what's the very special thing about the data that. Um, Dean was working with is that not many people can turn this knob. It's, it's a kind of a Swansea specialization that we, we, we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you, you mentioned something called instantons and anti instantons, so what, what the hell are they? <laughs> <laughs> They're the, for the pseudo particles that um, exist in topological charge density fields. So, uh, unlike a normal particle which will exist infinitely uh, these appear and disappear in the for the uh, data sets of Lattice QCD. So um, effectively the instanton and the anti-instanton, they represent the density of quarks and antiquarks. No, <laughs> not as such, no. They're, 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 they're derived from the properties of the of the glue, glue fields, which you, okay, haven't, yeah. you haven't mentioned, but they're, they're, they're part of the they're part of the threeness bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, they're pseudo particles rather than particles. That's one of the major things that we found interesting. That's why um, I looked at them on the joint continent with the uh, time slices to try and actually track the things as they appear and disappear in the volume. So they're more related to the glue field. Than they are, yeah. Okay. Anyway. This, this always happens when I'm in a fight and I start answering the questions. <laughs> I mean, very... There are going to be lots of visualization questions, too. Yeah, my very naive idea... These, the, Dean, Dean's answered the question correctly, these, but these things are basically blobs. And uh, one of the questions was, do those... Do those blobs change as you change the chemical potential? Do they become bigger? Do they become smaller? Are they, are they this, you know, distributed in the same way in all four directions? Or as you turn the chemical potential up, is one direction? Do they become elongated or squashed in a particular direction? Uh, these, these are all questions. These are, these are things that we set out to think about. I'm not sure how successful we were in the end in answering them, but they're, they're, these were, that was our starting point. That, that's going to be very useful to know, Dean, yeah. in, your, in your Viva. So my understanding is you wanted to know what happened to the, the particles as you changed the varied the chemical potential. Yeah. yeah. Just if, if you're interested, this is, this is very closely related to the question I asked you about what is data visualization good for. 
Okay, so that yeah. you could really impress the examiners if you put those two questions together. So in the database class, we say it's good for exploration, mm -hmm. analysis, presentation, acceleration, and, and building confidence. And you can, so what Simon is talking about, when I'm listening to Simon, he's talking about exploration. Very yeah. much so, very yeah. much so. So it, you, can, you can tie those two, two things. Yeah, like I mean, one, that was punch. one of the core things of creating the framework was to support exploration because using things like visit and that requires you to have some sort of knowledge basically of what you're going to visualize whereas this you can just do what you want with <laughs> explore how you want you need a slide mm -hmm. called contributions okay. i didn't see that would that go at the end after my results or i would put that near the beginning okay it's near the beginning of your thesis, right? It's at the it's one section one three. Okay. So a question: you, If you don't have that slide, it might be a question. Even if you do have the slide, what are your contributions? Um, well, I would like to hope that I've introduced <laughs> topology to lattice QCD uh, scientists uh, as a way of incorporating into the workflow. Um, so they can compute some advanced properties of the data, but also so they can explore the data using this sort of idea of connectivity. Um, so it's kind of like two major contributions, a way of exploring the data in a new way, uh, a way of analysing the data in a, a way they didn't have before. Okay. Would you say your framework is only for advanced users? Um, it requires a, as well a certain amount of knowledge of visualization in terms of like what the item values mean and sort of thing. So to be able to understand that you're actually moving the ISO value around. Um, but the actual interface I think would be relatively easy to pick up and use. Just to open file and uh, select the view and to actually navigate it. So that that is interestingly enough a very good and possible question, the one that Liam just asked. Okay. I would write that one down. And and in my opinion the answer is rather an expert user. This okay. is not this is not yeah, I mean, general, I would say... You, you started to describe the mechanics of using the software. I, I wouldn't bother. I would say this is, this is meant for Simon yeah. and his friends. I uh, expect you have users. like a certain level of knowledge, sort of like if you use Visit or Paraview or something like that. So it's not something you would immediately understand unless you knew a little bit about visualization. That Maybe the framework itself is for experts, but the visualizations are. Perhaps I can chip in here because Dean did mention there are. I mean, other people have tried, have explored visualization techniques. There's a very, there's a several groups who've done it, and actually, as far as I can see, the main use of the results is is in uh, promoting their work, <laughs> and, and also, you know, trying to convey a very complicated theory. Which is, you know, we, as we've discussed, is actually quite difficult and mysterious. Trying to to, to present that in a, in a visually appealing way. But actually, the most famous application of, of the line waiver paper, as you pro as I think we may have noticed, yeah. is that they actually appeared in in uh, a Nobel Prize acceptance speech. Okay. So the guy who invented QCD, and he yeah. he used Derek's pictures to yeah. as part of his his acceptance speech. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the presentation part yeah, exactly. of, of data is yeah I mean it's, it's, it's uh, yeah very nice and we, we, you know we are, we are now obviously doing the same thing with, with Dean's Dean's pictures we're putting them in on you know on our web page and our, <laughs> all our presentations hey look kids this is cool <laughs> they do look pretty good aren't <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah I mean at a conference and that was quite good when I went to the physics conference we just had a 
set of uh, surfaces and then people will like immediately ask what they were sort of thing, rather than just line graphs. Or okay, there are still some very challenging questions you're likely to get. Mm -hmm. What is topology-based visualization? So this uses, well it's an extension of um, indirect volume rendering, so largely used in indirect volume rendering, you can use it in indirect volume rendering, but effectively you, you take the mathematical models of indirect volume rendering and you compute the connectivity between them, so you get a number of benefits, uh, so for example you can use it to speed up the rendering process by, uh, so if you have marching cubes doing ISO services, they would march over potentially empty cells, but instead you can use this to see contours. So you have connected regions which you can then interact with. You can actually see them in parallel for rendering if you like. Um, Write that question down please. You need a good answer for what is topology based visualization. Cool. It, in, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really, it wasn't particularly bad the answer you gave. Mm -hmm. But it didn't Just look like, you, like were, you didn't look like, it didn't feel like you were prepared for that question. No. <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, in my opinion, it's, it's extracting the critical points of the data set mm -hmm. and then also identifying the connections between them. Yeah. Typical critical points would be local minima, local maxima, degenerate points, and things like that. Yeah. And then examining the connections between them. Yeah. And okay, I don't know what the examiners are going to be like, but there are potentially some very difficult questions in this in this direction. And the reason, one of the reasons, is because both examiners do not have a background in topology-based yeah. visualization. <laughs> not many people do. That is why I was saying to Joss, <laughs> was it's going to be quite hard to find someone. With a this bit is of where some interesting questions are going to, could potentially be asked. So yeah. you need to have. Now you jumped right in to the benefits of topology-based visualization. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let let's ask that question again. What are the benefits of, of topology-based visualization? So it enables us to assign additional meaning to the data by actually examining the connectivity. Um, and we can also use it as a way of speeding up the rendering process. Um, so, seeing the uh, individual contours perhaps in parallel, so they can be rendered or computed in parallel. Write that question down, please. Okay. You would need an answer, a good answer for that. The benefits of topology based visualization there are three. There are three kind of at least at least three basic ones: a reduction in, in data set size, so you go from a, the raw data set, which is huge, to a skeletonized version of the data set. So you have a massive mm -hmm. data set size reduction. That's one of the benefits. Yeah. Another is computation. So you can run computational algorithms much faster on topological skeletons of a data set than the original. Mm -hmm. And the third is, is perception, or arguably perception, because you're taking something potentially that's very large and complicated, and you're reducing it down to something much simpler. Mm -hmm. right? So per perceptually, there, there are advantages too. There are some disadvantages too, though. So what? That's a, so again. That's a tricky question. What's a disadvantage? Uh, Topology-based visualization. So I would say the most obvious one is you actually need to know what you're looking at in order to be able to understand it. So the tree structures. Once you've got a feeling for the topology, make a lot of sense. But up until that point. You don't particularly understand the data structures, uh, especially when it comes to you scrolling through the ISO surfaces. The idea that you're not looking at everything at once, even though it fits a 3D volume, I find it quite confusing stuff. <laughs> yes, interpretation is, is a big challenge. Yeah. You, you could mention, if you want, you might want to write that question down, by the way. You could mention 
to topology can topo topological methods can introduce errors too. Yeah. And and that can cause some some difficulties. However, yeah. however, that can be said about every single visualization method on, on the planet, basically. But if if you want to sound smart, you, you can you can. Should I go that. into like limitations of the algorithm, or should I just wait for? <laughs> No, you have to have you have to have an answer for what is topology based visualization, what are its benefits. I don't know if they're gonna ask you like what are the drawbacks. That's quite Yeah, a, I mean quite one a, of the things I was gonna say. Well I, I thought of a question that I would ask about it was so in topology you have the idea of like e numbers and stuff like that, which tell you like the number of poles in the object in, in dimensions. The actual contour tree and the read graph don't always capture that information, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you can augment it into the graph, but the actual algorithms just look for path connectedness. Yeah, that's, so... Is right. that something I should bring up, or just sort of wait and see if they ask about it? <laughs> if, these yes. guys, if these guys are not experts in this particular field, it's, it's actually a bad sign if you get into prolonged discussion about the problems. Yeah, yeah. You, you, I would. I'm guessing that they're going to be asking like, what is topology-based visualization? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, that's a perfectly valid question coming from these examiner, from any examiner. Yeah. Right? If I can, Mark will almost certainly ask you about topology-based visualization because visualization is something that he, he's close to. Yeah. He will definitely ask you about things like contour trees because it's something that I've discussed with him quite a lot. Yes, sorry he's, about that. That's good. Uh, no, that's good because I've got a real good understanding those, of those. Those are the base. next questions. You yeah. have to have an answer for what is a contour tree and what is a read graph. Okay. So the contour tree is um, a way of capturing the critical points in the data and connections between them. So as you sweep through the ice or surfaces, you come across critical points, which are the uh, birth and death of a, a specific object or the merging of one or two objects or two objects. Uh, the arcs on the contour tree actually represent connections between these events and from there you can see a a, a contour um, which is like a manifold which deforms over the length of the contour tree or the arc. Uh, so it's a way of capturing connectivity between the minimum ice value and the maximum ice value. Okay, and the Reeve graph? So the Reeve graph is a generalization of the contour tree which is able to handle uh, periodic boundaries and uh, non-simply connected domains. So uh, if you had a mesh defined on a, a torus or something like that, you can actually compute the Reeve graph of that. So the major difference is you can have loops in a Reeve graph which represent holes in the uh, input domain or loops in the input domain. Uh, so the actual contour tree can be uh, used as a way of speeding up the Reeve graph computation if you make symbolic cuts, uh, ideally like on the bank or what would be the boundary so you can reduce the Reeve graph computation down to a contour tree. Okay, that sounds like you're prepared for those. And what is the joint contour tree? As of the joint tree and the split tree. I see, I see a subjection called the joint contour net. Uh, so the joint contour net is a way of capturing multivariate topology. So what it does is it maps out uh, regions uh, called slabs, which are interval volumes where the two functions have a fit in a specific bin. Uh, so you may set the slab size to a certain interval, and in that slab you'll capture the information for that particular region. Um, so the joint contour net maps the barrier centre of each of these regions to the vertices and the arcs represent adjacency between slabs. Okay. This is a, effectively a way of capturing the multivariate topology. 
good, good. You've been thinking about those. That's good. And why is it? I don't know. If they, well, we don't know what they're going to ask. Obviously, okay. we may as well ask some challenging questions. Why not just run the univariate topology multiple times and get multiple read graphs so, rather than a, a, a just compare them side by side instead? There of, are. Um, there are methods for doing such things. You can um, compare the actual contour trees by um, looking at the edit distance of the graph. Um, one of the major advantages of the joint contour net is it allows us to actually compare the two data sets directly and sort of compute the common. So, like when we use it in the ensemble study, we can look at overlapping contours and get an idea of what's changed between one data set and the other. Good, good answer. <laughs> now I can see we're entering your comfort zone. That's a good, good thing. <laughs> That's, That's good. good. Super went, uh, worth mentioning as well, with edit distance, how expensive it is to compute. Yeah, I mean there's, there's quite a few like, limitations on you have to compute like uh, branch decompositions of the contour tree, so you have to map every potential way of getting through the contour tree. Uh, so there's, there's a possible way of doing it, but it still means effectively you're just comparing graphs. Mm. Whereas at this you're actually comparing surfaces as well. I know we're way off uh, this topic, um, but on your slides, mm -hmm. I think there's like your second slide. Um, wake up. Uh, you had the uh, discussion of the QCD, uh, QCDs. Right. And on the second bold point, you said the QCD models. Okay. Yeah. It took me uh, a bit of time to realize that you meant models as in. Two model rather than the nine model. So, so uh, yeah, running. like uh, in terms of model, there I'm, I'm talking about actually creating a computation. Yeah, two, two model. Uh, it was just something that yeah, you know, maybe so change yeah, the way. Uh, creating like a, a computational way of reps and labs. Yes. So, mm. yeah. so. you might we we we'd say it differently as we we. In physics, model is a little, kind of pre slightly pejorative term. It's it's kind of a, a picture which may not be too accurate. Or yeah. No matter, we regard QCD as one of the best physical theories we have. It, it's probably really just true. Yeah, I'm thinking of it from a <laughs> from a software sort of model. What's the probability? Right? It's, just, it's just a weird change. Oh, yeah, it's, it's not a big deal. But it's just something that I picked up on yeah. when you were yeah. presenting. And uh, it took me a second to realise that that was silly. Um, one question I was going to ask about the presentation. Would it be a good idea to have the like, bullet points come in one at a time, or is it just around? Mm -hmm. I don't like uh, I I think it's making fine. it look too... I think it's fine as long as it's consistent. When I, when, I, sorry, when I do a Viber, we quite, we quite often uh, start off with getting the students to make a presentation, and you know, these, these examiners have been polite enough to actually tell you in advance that that's going to happen. What we really want to do, <laughs> part of what we're doing is obviously giving you a chance to, to hear what you think is the important stuff. It's also settling you down and getting you, getting your feet moving. And, yeah. And because what we want to achieve over the two hours or whatever, we just want to have an interesting conversation about science and we want to find, so I wouldn't worry too much about the, those kind of fine details of the they're really just no. warming you up. I need That's to like right. uh, focus on the high level questions rather than the actual. Yeah. So what is visualization? The sort of thing I like overlook. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And some of those questions are so obvious that you may as well have a slide prepared for them. Yeah. That's a good one. Thirty background slides. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean the other sort of part of the sociology is that. The examiners will start off asking you questions in their comfort zone. Yeah. And your goal is to steer the viva towards your comfort zone, which is, <laughs> yeah. which is very much the how. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so.
So uh, a question you need to be prepared for is like, what are your findings? What did you learn or what did you discover from your research visualizing these amazing simulations with your joint contour trees and, and so on? Um, so, yeah. That's a, that you have to be prepared for that question. So, from the ensemble studies we did, uh, we did find that potentially changing the chemical potential and the temperature of the lattice could affect the topology of the lattice. Um, so, we found um, variances in how quickly the cooling algorithm seemed to converge, uh, which was quite interesting. Uh, we also saw that the number of objects and properties of the objects potentially changes as you move across the phase diagram. Uh, so it would be interesting to see if this was uh, a recurring phenomenon and not just something in our data set that happened to show up. Uh, so I'd really like to see someone else use it. <laughs> I mean, what, what I can add. And this is not so. I mean, my, my feeling a, a few months now removed from this project is that what you really need is actually is better data. You need a better simulation. Yeah. Which means a more expensive simulation. Um, it may well be that the lattices that we were using were just too small and too coarse to, to really you know, yeah. bear the fruits of this new approach. So. I would have a slide prepared for that question. Okay. Personally. Yeah. For sure. And that's something very obvious we didn't mention. What? How big are the simulation files? So the actual lattices in this uh, instance are quite small. Uh, well, what I would call quite small. So um, the ones we mainly focused on were 12 cubed by 12 or 24 time slices. Uh, the actual real complexity comes from the ensemble nature of it. So having to do 50 computations on the same effective lattice. Also, if you introduce a cooling, then you have to introduce another dimensionality as you cool the data if you want to analyze it that way. How long does it take to run a simulation, an ensemble simulation, so, uh, you know, a useful ensemble? Uh, to, 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 to produce or to analyze? To produce in the first place. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an extensive challenge. Uh, I can't I can't remember the actual period, of, you know, sort of clock time. But I mean, yeah. we're, we're using millions of core hours. Mm -hmm. you know, more, you know. Actually, the, the the best the sort of state of the art lattice QCD calculation consumes about ten to the between ten to the seventeen and ten to the nineteen working point operations. Could you put that in like human terms? Like it takes somebody three weeks to oh, yeah yeah okay we're we're, we're we're talking months, months if not years to generate these ensembles. Okay. Depends on the resources you've got available to you. But the the, the examiners might ask, yeah. how long yeah. does it take to to? We're not we can't redo all all these over, over, over you know if we get the wrong answer we can't redo them and come back in a week's time. <laughs> 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 Um, okay, that's well, one of the things we also found was um, the actual storage, although they're, they're relatively small because of the amount of them, mm. you tend to chuck some of the actual data away or on those simulations. We didn't have every single step along the Markov chain, for example, they would discard every third. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think you could you could turn this around to your advantage because so much resource is invested in generating this data. We need to, and, and you know, this isn't a, this isn't a new observation. We need the, to explore as many possible analysis yeah. techniques as possible, and the the ana you know the analysis that, that Dean is presenting is, is pretty novel in physics terms. Nobody else is thinking this way, and it would generalize to any. 
mm. existing data, so you wouldn't have to regenerate it for it, it's mm. on top of existing data. I think that's one of the big contributions, is that the code base that you're putting out sort of connected to your implementations of these algorithms, the contour tree, the join, the split tree, the merge trees, all of this, and the fact that it generalizes to n dimensions, that's a, that's a huge contribution compared to the when you started and everything was a couple of C libraries from people who were very much sort of yeah. specific domain application, so their code was tailored to that. Yeah. And made it almost unusable even for what you Yeah, were I mean, to do. Uh, in theory, if you had a different data set, you could write a parser for it and read it in and generate the fields and visualize them from something which already exists. Uh, so you can reuse existing data, you don't have to generate more data just to analyze it with the topological. <laughs> so you'll need to be prepared for this question. What's novel in your work? Uh, the use of topology uh, in Lattice QCD. Uh, that's probably the most novel feature of it. Uh, and from the physics side of it, the actual modification of the chemical potential. So that's something which is rarely done in physics. Yeah. So it also gives us an extra dimensionality to what we can visualize and what we can actually ask of the data. I um, think that's a perfect answer. So in, in, in physics, in quantum field theory, um, you know, QCD is a quantum field theory though, um, you, you tend to phrase questions in terms of products of fields at particular points or with particular separations. And it's, Quite code away. So to actually throw all that away and just say, no, we're going to look for blobs and we're going to ask where do the blobs separate, where do they merge, how big are they, what shape are they, that's a completely new set of, it's a, it's a, new, it's a new tool kit. Yeah, it's a new exploration. Yeah. Now, it, it may, it, we don't know if it's going to succeed. I, I, you know, if, you, if you can show, if you can get answers, if, if, if it looks like something interesting happens when you turn a knob, then you're kind of saying, well, maybe that's the way to... Th no, maybe this toolkit can be useful for something. I don't. My own view is we haven't really demonstrated that. You know, so you can draw a line under it, but you certainly started to ask mm -hmm. new questions. Yeah. So that that, that that easily an examiner could ask: Have phys have the physicists formulated any new hypotheses based on what you show based on your work? Yeah. Um, I guess from the outset we. When we started looking at the ISO surfaces, we started asking copies of the actual instantons. Uh, initially, we looked at shape and maybe whether they were stretched or anything you know, as, uh, as parameters for change. Um, but we actually like, went with just the idea of counting the number of objects, uh, specific ISO values, uh, and yeah, largely just actually counting the objects because we could get a rough idea of the balance of positive and negative. But as far as I know, it was impossible to actually ask um, how many of each was there. Uh, and we could also, from those objects, get a rough idea of like properties, so size, uh, volume. Um, so yeah, that was some of the questions we sort of asked once we started using the tool to just explore the data. Mm -hmm. It might be to your advantage as well to look at the other applications of joint contour nets and, and read graphs because my gut feeling is that nobody uses these things. And, and That's quite niche, isn't that? Yes, yes. So, <laughs> you might be able to turn that around to your advantage and say we are the first people to apply joint contour net visualization to anything. Uh, <laughs> the joint contour net has got a very limited um, use up until now because it's only come out in about 2013 I think Hamish mm -hmm. came up with it. So there's a scissions, um, nuclear scission study they did and there was also Hurricane uh, Zobel, is it the, the data set that commonly comes up? Those are the only two real existing uses I know of it. Mm -hmm. So part of the appeal of it was no one used it before as well. Yeah, so you can't three is pretty good. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, to answer that question, I think you need to show the plot, a plot where data sets of different chemical potentials do different things. Because, yeah. you know, that, that's, I think that's as close, as far along the road towards our initial goal mm -hmm. as, as we've got. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... it's it, it, it's it's not a strong thing, but it's it, it's where we got to. Yeah, and I think that, that would be what I would say. Yeah, that sort of was answered the question of like, could we use this in a yeah. in an existing world? Um, yeah, it's you might get a question about the order of your choices. You know, you, you start with volume vis, you mm -hmm. then go to marching cubes, then you go to topology. So you might be you might get questions about why are you following this order of mm -hmm. visualization strategies? Why do you start with volume rendering and then try marching cubes and then try topology based vis? Yeah. Would it be valid to say the main reason to start with the right volume rendering is because Ed in physics had done it, so we knew a benchmark for what we expected it to look at. Look. That's a good answer. Um, and from mm -hmm. there, experimented with isosurfaces, um, actually visualizing the isosurfaces allowed us to see the objects and some sort of relationship between them. So the actual topology was able to capture that in a way we could understand. There's another answer, that's a good answer, another generic answer that always applies is mm -hmm. it makes sense to start with off-the-shelf tools yeah. to see how far we can get with those before developing customized tools. Okay, yeah. You know, that, that's also generic. Yeah, because I know Visit, the last time I looked at it, doesn't do contour trees. Mm -hmm. uh, a VTK can do read graphs as an addition to the. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem to be core visualization. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can see where our endurance is starting to impact, <laughs> which is fine. Anybody have any other, like, off, like, strange, out of left field questions? Strange questions are good. I've got one about the actual uh, software that you produce. Uh -huh. Um, so you said you introduced some features that came from um, uh, ideas that guys in physics had. Yeah. Um, is was there any kind of specific vis uh, features you wanted to introduce? If it's an exploration tool. That um, I guess the whole topology thing itself was born out of like initial um, exploratory and visualization. So actually providing ways of looking at the contour tree and manipulating the contour tree, interacting with the contour tree. Um, and later on I used it as a way of looking at the output for the joint contour net as well, so you can actually look at it alongside the um, univariate sort of data sets we had as well. My memory of all this is that you, you, you showed me those first kind of pictures of eyes and surfaces, and you know, I was obviously very happy with that. What I was expecting to see, and then I pointed to the left hand side and said, "What the hell is that thing with the sticks?" And he said, "That's a contour tree." And yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard from there we just. Uh, I guess the things kind of took off from there. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it was just one of those things that when we were messing around with it originally, it, it come in quite a useful way of like capturing the data. So the features kind of more evolved from the actual exploration. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're very I, much collaborative. When you start, I was, yeah, okay, you got to remember, I mean, Rita also isn't, isn't here, who's kind of the third, another arm of this thing, but yeah, I was very much thinking just in terms of blobs when we started, because that's all, that was what I was expecting, that's what other people have found when they, when they do this. So that brings up another interesting aspect is were your users able to interpret the joint contour nets and the, the um, so graphs? The joint contour net 
maybe less so it's quite hard to get your head around since <laughs> it took me quite a long time to get my head around that. Uh, I think the concentrate and the rebrow, after I sort of explained the idea behind it, they, I know Simon learned to use it uh, eventually. <laughs> yeah. it, took me quite a, it took me quite a while to get my head around exactly what it was doing. Um, so. so the examiners, like I still don't understand them. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to Hamish about this, and I said, I'd be happy to help you. You just have to help me understand what joint quantum nets are and, and those things. Yeah. So, Simon, what, what is your answer, just out of curiosity? Joint quantum. Like, could you interpret those, those graphs in a, in a helpful got, we, way? We've got a certain... Uh, it was hard. It was hard. And I always felt it was... We were always going... I'd always want to go back to the pit, the, the isosurface plot. Um, so, no, it hasn't hasn't as yet influenced my you know, changed the way I think about QCD, and perhaps that's that's a slightly negative message. But I do think I would like to see these methods applied to a better data set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the regraph and the contour tree are, are more easy to understand because. Uh, So in terms of this graph here, the arcs on the contour tree, uh, whenever you, so if you think of the isovalue as moving up and down the y-axis, as you intersect each line, that will correspond to a single object. So, depends how high I can reach. So up here, we would be looking at a single object, which would correspond to this arc. Well, if we came further down, cut through here, there'd be three separate contours. So in terms of an isosurface, they'd just be captured as one isosurface, but using the contours, you get three separate objects. So that's the major, uh, probably the easiest way of looking at the data. And it took me quite a long time to get that, because I assumed the actual critical points, which are the actual vertices would be the interesting part of the graph. Actually, it's the arc in this case. What well, obviously the critical points are interesting from the visualization side of it is actually the arc which sees the objects. I think if I were in your shoes, I would prepare some slides, especially for these questions like mm -hmm. what is a reed graph, what is a joint contour tree, and, 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 and those different topological yeah. uh, things. Because I think, it, I just had a psychic moment that the examiners will be wishing they could understand the joint contour net. They, they, they might not say, can you teach me what a joint contour net is in a way that I can understand it? Yeah. But they'll be thinking it. Okay, yeah. They'll be thinking it. They, they're not going to ask that question because it's kind of embarrassing. But that thought will be running. And it runs through my mind, too. And I, and I would love to have a, a, a three-minute tutorial with a nice explanation of here is what... You don't, wouldn't have to do it in the, in the introduction, yeah. but you'd have it as your extra slide. Yeah. So when that topic comes up, and they start asking you questions about joint contour nets. You can say, "Oh well, I, I have, I have, I'm prepared for this question. I have a slide, so let's go to that slide yeah. and I'll try to explain." Okay, yeah, yeah, it would probably make sense because, well, what it is is visual. <laughs> At the end of the day, so it yeah, helps exactly. out. Absolutely visual. Exactly. It, it, you'll be very happy that you have a slide with a picture rather than just trying to hand wave. Yeah. Your, your Would it be valid to reuse other people's explanations? So yes, yes. So I wouldn't credit. want to try and draw, draw a visualization of a joint contour net myself because they're not the easiest things to like map out. <laughs> but, yeah. Just cool. cite where you got them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, say where you got them. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, yeah. But, yeah. So when, when we used to talk about this stuff, um, I don't really get for a conversation about saying the term height function. Mm -hmm. sort of a dozen or a thousand times every paragraph, but uh, 
I don't think we sort of mentioned it at all that all of this is topology with respect to height functions. And when you explained joint contour nets to me, it was always with respect to the fact that you have the same data but now two height functions. Yeah. And it's the correlation so between effectively the topology of one height function and another. The Reeb graph is a continuous sort of mapping of uh, height to um, to the number of objects or whatever as you go up through. Uh, the joint contour net uses intervals, so you would have um, you would capture a region between say iso values one point five and two point five uh, on like one variable and maybe the same on the other one, and in that region the iso value falls into that range. So it's a range based approach to um, chopping up the input data. Uh, so it's not directly the same as the Reeb graph, it's a, uh, like a way of capturing it but with intervals instead of like a continuous. Uh, I know recently uh, they've actually come up with a continuous method of capturing a Reeb space, but uh, last year I think Hamish came up with that. So, so Hamish. Uh, I think Everybody the last Hamish, Hamish, is, Hamish, Hamish is probably about the only person you could <laughs> like. <laughs> um, Anyways, so, I, I do me a personal favor and have a slide that ex, that gives the, the three minute tutorial on each of those things. Yes, yeah. and you'll you'll be happy you did that. I think. Okay. And yeah, the examiners cool. will be happy you did that as well. Uh, yeah, it'd be much easier to work with something yeah. visual. Yes. Yes. If someone was to pick up where you finished your research, what would you like them to do? Uh, basically, what Simon said: try it on some more data. <laughs> uh, we're the only people to ever actually have used it, so we're hoping that what we've taken from our ensemble study is correct, but we've got nothing to validate it against, so we can say for certain that. Um, what we've taken as potentially the topology changes as the uh, parameters to the simulation change, so the temperature or the chemical potential. We're well, we're not assuming, but we're hoping that that actually captures something that happens in reality. Uh, but without actually having something else to compare against, we can say for certain. Uh, so I'm hoping the actual examples are used. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, just to just, you know, just to put things in context, that's actually the way our whole field works. It's not just one group in performing simulations. Typically, I mean, there are, when we have the annual conference in Lattice QCD, you know, maybe, maybe 500 people show up. So the way progress happens in this field is is, is by different groups or collaborations, just kind of competing each other using slightly different computational techniques, but all, all basically with the same kind of faith <coughs> that this is, a, this is a, a, you know, a correct representation and a correct computational model for how, how, to, how, to, how to get to the truth. And, uh, so, we, you know, uh, way back we said that, you know, what one feature of the, the lattice is that it gives you this is cut off so there's a certain resolution, so the money goes into making that cut off small. It also goes in, this is something which we haven't talked about, but it also goes into making the quarks light because that makes the, that makes this, the, this, the production of the data more expensive. Uh, so these are all things that you, we'd want to do in time to make things realistic, but very typically whenever you're trying something new, you start off coarse and heavy. If it looks promising, you try and go fine and light. Yeah, I guess really I'd like to see someone else use it. <laughs> yeah, at least like use some of the ideas we come up with. So, is the framework open source? Then? Uh, it's sort of in. A, it's not no. open source, but you can have the source code if you want it. <laughs> uh, well, obviously I haven't put it open source yet because I'm actually technically finished. It. PhD, so I'm going to put it out there. But by Friday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've hit a button and everything. Do it in the mind. Yeah. As soon as the pattern comes yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyone can sort of look at the, the uh, code if they want. 
Excellent. Any other questions for Dean? Thank yeah. you, Dean. How I think that was a very useful exercise. Yeah. I think that was very useful. Um, hopefully I'll feel a bit more confident about it now <coughs> and know what I'm actually going to get asked a bit more. So. Can, I, can I just tell you a story about a PhD vibe I did in another university? Depends if it's a good ending or... <laughs> Supervisor phoned me up to invite me, and he sort of said he clearly had reservations about the student. But you know, we went along, and I read the thesis, and it was okay. But the student in the vida was great; he could answer every question I asked. And the supervisor was sitting there; he was present. He thought he, he needed to be. So, so at the end, I said, "Well, thank you. You know, that's that's all the questions I had. But would you please step outside?" And we'll... and the minute the guy had closed the door, the supervisor said. That guy should buy lottery tickets. He says, every question you ask, we rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's nice. He got his PhD. Which university was that? I can't reveal that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, De they, decent university, Russell Group. At least they had a practice viva. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's nice. Yeah. That's not very common, I think. Yeah. Good. I think you're going to do much better now. Yeah, well, I definitely know some of the, the more easy questions that I've just overlooked. Yeah. 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 Do you have some notes I took in case they're ah, useful? Cool. I did I did record it. Yeah, I know. This is my camera. <laughs> if I can, I'll try to upload you to the tomorrow on this subject. Yeah, also, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, see you know, uh, John Physics uh, on the Science <laughs> yeah. uh, That's right, on the, on the HPC map. Yeah. yeah, that's great. It's a shame. Uh, so I have quite a few meetings. Well, you do. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.